welcome to the Friday afternoon live stream. I'm Bobby Burton. It's time for the round table. We're going to start something new on Friday afternoons. A little bit here. Uh, I'm Bobby Burton, joined by CJ Vogel up top. He's the young gun. Jerry Hamilton in the middle. He's all uh, <laughs> facial products, uh, shaving and stuff. And then Rod Babers at the bottom, uh, the former Longhorn uh, All American slash Shaw Conference slash NFL. The slash fastest gun. The fastest, <laughs> he is the fastest gun. Still. Um, we're going to talk a little Longhorn football this afternoon. I uh, hopefully uh, send you guys out uh, on a good Friday afternoon so y'all can hit happy hour a little early. Uh, maybe not too early, but early enough. Uh, CJ, I'm going to start with you. I talked to uh, Rod. I talked to uh, uh, Jerry th earlier this morning. You're hearing anything from practice of late from yesterday? Yeah, I, I know it wasn't a, a full contact deal. I think you mentioned that earlier today on uh, Coffee and Football, Bobby, but uh, certainly – a practice to get the guys ready again for the scrimmage this weekend, which is kind of one of those things where you look at the coaching staff at the moment and they know they have talent, they know they have depth, but this is the big uh, test, if you will, for these guys. You'll have three of them in the spring. You had one a week ago. This is that other opportunity to get those guys to separate themselves from the group of guys uh, at each position. So uh, I, I like what I'm hearing behind the scenes. You know, I, I'm hearing the offensive side of the ball is making plays in the red zone. Uh, the offensive line specifically is moving bodies uh, right now. And you can kind of uh, pin that as a good thing on the offensive line, of course, with a lot of familiarity coming back. But on the defensive side, you know, is that an issue? Is that one that uh, will be a glaring weakness? We've had those conversations in the past. We, of course, think Texas needs to make an addition or two out of the portal in that interior de defensive line spot. But right now, the success that I'm hearing about in the red zone is probably that big, uh, you know, that that big positive for me at the moment, of course, the big, uh, you know, blundering question mark from a year ago into the spring. Will Texas improve? Surely right now hearing good things in terms of what they're able to do and achieve with that red zone offense at the moment. Rod Babers, uh, you know, that's got to be music to your ears because I think that's something you, you belabored as an issue really from the start of last year. Uh, Bert Auburn, I think, what did he attempt? 31 field goal attempts. Is that, am I right about that? Uh, wow. CJ, our statistic, a statistician may have to tell me. Uh, that <laughs> uh, long story short, if, if, if the Longhorns are going to get better next year, we've said all along that uh, improvement in the uh, red zone is imperative. Uh, the question is, uh, how are they improving in the red zone? Is it the run game? Uh, yeah. Because they've got an older uh, offensive line? Is it because they're using more two? To running back package, uh, Rod, you've mentioned that. Is it, uh, by the way, is it uh, maybe someone like uh, Quinn Ewer starting to throw the ball into tighter windows, uh, which we think is part of it too. Uh, Rod, what do, what do you have to say about the uh, red zone type stuff right now and uh, and where this this is at? I'm afraid we may have lost, Jerry. I'm going to go to uh, – we lost Rod there. Jerry, I'm going to go to you instead. Uh, you're hearing about the red zone stuff right now. What are, What are your thoughts? Well, I, my thoughts on the red zone are this, um, it, because everybody tries to tie it to how many touchdown passes Quinn's going to have next year. I, and, you know, I want his touchdown passes to be a little lower than other people. I'd love to see him throw 28 touchdowns, because that means Texas is running the ball in the red zone for touchdowns. I want more running back touchdowns in the red zone this year. If Texas is running the ball effectively in the red zone, uh, that's a major step as far as experience of a team. And that really, that next step, not that Texas hasn't been a very physical team, but that next step and kind of that final step in, all right, we can walk out here and we're going to, we can be as physical as anybody in college football and get it done. That's what I'm looking for. Um, you know, that, 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 that's the real big, for me, turning point in the red zone. The last touchdown passes Quinn throws in the red zone, as long as Texas is scoring touchdowns, the better team Texas is going to be. Gotcha. All right. We're going to be taking y'all's questions today. This is going to be a kind of a free form Friday. Rod will rejoin us. He had some connectivity uh, issues there. Uh, where are you guys all checking in from? Let's look. Let's do a little roll call here. <laughs> Belton, Texas. I wonder if he's at Lake Belton today, uh, this afternoon. Uh, howdy from Lindale, Texas. That's East Texas. Oh, wow. This is this is like the least favorite place. E. Kim's at the dentist. We hey, I forgot about that one, Bobby. He did not have a fun time yesterday. No one does really. <laughs> oh, Rod didn't have a good time at the dentist. That's where he was yesterday before uh, the winning drive. Yeah, was he, was, he, oh, it was looking good. 
Uh, so, yeah, somebody I, from I, Dale, I, Oklahoma. I knew Durant, he was going to have uh, at some point uh, his uh, wisdom teeth taken out. Durant, Oklahoma, Little Rock here from Corey yeah. King uh, as well. Just all around the country. Uh, happy you guys are here. Uh, Rod Babers is now back with us. Rod, I get to ask you that question now, buddy. And I know you heard it, but you couldn't answer it because of the connection. Uh, Texas in the red zone, it, them being better and that's got to be music to your ears. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was definitely the biggest issue on offense last year. And I think the most troubling part was, you know, I don't, I don't, I couldn't identify exactly what the main issue was. I'm not sure Sark had identified it during the season. I would love for somebody to be able to sit him down and get, you know, the real answer about after his deep dive rabbit hole research about the red zone issues this off season, what did he find? Um, did he find that it was one glaring issue, multifactorial, uh, because with all the talent you had at wide receiver, at tight end, offensive line, the biggest O-line in the Big 12, and Quinn Ewers, you know, you, and the running back situation at Texas, there was no real reason you should have been able to uh, remedy that or resolve the issue during the season, and they just didn't. The entire season, uh, Texas had red zone issues. Uh, sometimes it was uh, due to, you know, ineffective play on the offensive line. Sometimes it was due to, you know, Quinn when you're not being able to get the progressions quick enough, sometimes the wide receivers, it was a multitude of different issues. So I'd love to see what he figured out. And you know what? Who cares? If, if, he, didn't, if he didn't even analyze it and figure out exactly what it was, I don't care as long as it improves. As long as it's an outlier uh, in, in terms of Sark's tenure here, as long as it's an outlier of the season, because that wasn't the case his first year, really, and it wasn't the case in 2022. Now, maybe without Rocha, without Bijan, that would be my concern is that maybe that was kind of his default red zone plan most of the time was Bijan and Rojo. So we'll see. I got a lot of confidence in Sark. Man, Sark, he takes on projects during the offseason. And, you know, these are the man in the mirror moments where he kind of examines, self-scouts, uh, figures out exactly where he needs to improve as a coach, where the team needs to improve. I thought he he did the, I thought he did a great job of addressing the, the, the issues his offense had with countering uh, the three high defense, the three high safety defense the offseason last year. I think he understood that it was going to be something that he was going to face, uh, you know, more than half of the teams on the schedule. I think he understood, and based on the research, that his offenses uh, performed at a lot less – they were a lot less effective and they were a lot less explosive versus those offenses. And I think he went to the, you know, to the, to the drawing board and, and came up with some really creative solutions to solve that issue. I'm assuming he'll do the same thing with the red zone. All right, before we get to the next question, I want to – Jerry, you have something you want to add there? Well, well, I just need to hit on a couple of recruiting things here uh, because somebody was hitting on DeCorey and Moore in Ohio State. Somebody asked about the chance he flips from LSU to Ohio State low. Um, I, I actually put a, a report out on ontexasfootball.com, uh, which you go over there and be an OG member, uh, that he is not visiting Ohio State this weekend. He is at a regional uh, area track meet in Waco, uh, running events uh, for him begin around 5.30 today. So he is not going to Ohio State, as some uh, had reported uh, earlier in the week. He's not going there this weekend. Uh, next weekend won't be the Texas spring game. Same thing. Those regional – the regional meet next week in Waco. Those running events start mid-afternoon. Uh, so will he stop by the Texas facility on Sunday? Uh, we'll see. He's going to have some family members at the Texas spring game. I'll say that on Saturday. Uh, before he runs, and then they'll make their way to Waco to watch him run. Uh, and then somebody asked about recruits in Georgia. I actually put a note on ontexasfootball.com this morning on this as well. Kevin Wynn, the four-star D tackle out of Green County High School in Greensboro, halfway between Atlanta and Athens, down that direction. Uh, it sounds like he's going to be in for the spring game after talking to somebody. In, uh, we're very close to that recruitment in Georgia. Uh, sounds like he's going to be coming in for the spring game, so an interesting development there for Texas on a prospect out of Georgia. Long way to go in that recruitment, but you got to get them on campus once before the official visit happens. All right, good stuff, Jerry. Hey, uh, Rod, I'm going back to you because I've, I've asked CJ this, and me and Jerry talked about it too. Uh, Aloha, fellas from Kauai. This is from Aloha Travel. Appreciate the super chat here. Jaden Blue mentioned this being a contract-type year for him. What kind of season does he need to land to be a first four-round pick? of next year's draft thinking wow. 1000 total yards eight tds is there a number or is this is, is he a first four round guy you think maybe because of his speed and quickness regardless of what the actual total numbers are rod 
or does he just need to have a quote unquote good year? Not necessarily number specific. Um, number specific is tough. Uh, I do like the, uh, the total yards, uh, thing thrown out there. Uh, cause I think that's where Jaden blues unique skill set applies. He said that's a short choice compares him to Jameer Gibbs. And that's, he'll say, if that's the case, uh, that's how Sark should utilize him. And if he weaponizes him in that way, you know, all he has to do is showcase productivity, but showcase his versatility that he is a guy that you can, you know, mo- motion out into the slot, that he can run some downfield routes, uh, that he can be a threat in the passing game and in the running game. You know, he's adding some weight. Uh, CJ talked about that. He admitted that he's, you know, too old. He, he's, you know, uh, one, he's approaching like 205, somewhere around there. Um, and I think that's because he wants to be able to be more effective in the inside run game with the inside zone, some of the interior runs, so those arm tackles don't break down. If this is a guy that gets to the perimeter and accelerates, we know nobody can catch him. But what if you applied that same acceleration to some of the inside runs, add a little bit of power so that you can break those arm tackles, and then once you beat that one man, you can pop it. And I think that's why he's, and he admitted he's working on his vision. I think that was just my theory. I bet the coaches told him, hey, man, when you these inside zones, you got to make sure that you your vision, be patient and wait for the hole to develop, wait for things to open up. And if you do, you can pop it, especially with your kind of speed. So I think he's working on his overall game. Um, I like the, you know, if, if Sark showcases him the right way, uh, like a Jameer Gibbs S player, I think he could get drafted in the first four rounds. It's hard for a running back though. These young, these young guys are smart too. They, they talk about that. He's talked about the devaluation of the running back position, how they want to, you know, share the burden of touches and carries and you want to share the backfield. So it's a short choice has been in their ear or they're educated on, you know, the durability of the running back, the shelf life of the running back these days. Uh, you know, Jay Blue's a guy that left high school, you know, early and set out a year and, you know, there were different reasons for it, but he remarked that he got hurt in middle school a lot. Um, and he wanted those, you basically want that year back uh, and to, to rest and heal and things like that. So I think these guys are pretty savvy. Uh, he said that his goal is to go to the NFL after this year. If Sark uses him, you know, in a J- Jameer Gibbs fashion that way and showcases his ability, he doesn't need a lot of plays. He just needs those crucial, you know, five to eight touches a game. If he gets those, I'm talking about really – uh, impactful five to eight touches where Stark almost showcases him with certain plays and certain personnel groupings, including the pony package. I think he's a guy that can get drafted in the first four rounds, but it's tough for a running back. I'll admit, man, they don't, they don't draft running backs high and the middle rounds for a running back actually is considered pretty good these days, even for the damn good. When we look at, you go know, look at, uh, you know, all the running backs that have performed really well in college, uh, they usually don't necessarily get drafted high because of that productivity. Um, that, that's something that can translate to the league, but not necessarily to the draft. And, and for any running back in the 25 NFL draft, the 24 NFL draft's not a great one for the running back position. 2025 is supposedly going to be a big step up, even if you even if you just consider the Ohio State guys, right? But uh, 2025 is supposed to be a much deeper running back draft, so a lot more competition for those slots coming in the 25 draft. All right, uh, this is the Friday afternoon live stream. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers, Jerry Hamilton, and CJ Vogel. Uh, before we we're going to be taking y'all's questions all afternoon. This is uh, what we're going to do today: a little round table for you. Uh, but before we start this net with this next question, I want to say thank you to one of our sponsors. Let's talk about Flat Creek Estate Winery. Flat Creek just won 11 awards in just 30 days, including Double Gold Grand Reserve and Texas Grand Reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking in the wards, and it's just a few minutes uh, from the out, uh, from, on the outskirts of Austin. Select bottles of wine by Flat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs, uh, so you can get a taste of what they're all about. Flat Creek Estate is also a gorgeous venue, hosting events for the family all spring. Check out their website for wine tastings, chef dinners, and even make a reservation to visit the property uh, for Mother's Day coming up if you want to treat uh, your mom or your wife, who happens to also be a mom, to a nice little extra thing. Eat, drink, and be awesome at Flat Creek Estate. For more info, visit flatcreekestate.com. Thank you for your sponsorship of On Texas Football. All right, you guys, I got to go in, and and that was a very pleasant experience. I I can imagine hanging out there on a Friday afternoon might be a little fun, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) You know, instead of hanging up with these with these four guys that you're talking to right now. (laughs) But Michael Rodriguez has a good question for us. Good afternoon. 
with the portal rapidly approaching, do y'all expect players to jump in the portal before the spring game or wait till after the game, which would definitely be revealing? Man, I, I think that after is most likely if yeah. they really think they are a, a, in the – man, even in the 2D, right, Jerry? Or, and CJ, what do y'all think? Yeah, I, I think even – we saw Jaden Alexis get in a spring game last year, then hit the portal. I uh, So unless somebody gets in trouble and has to leave, uh, I think we're going to see guys uh, uh, stay until – compete in the spring game, leave afterwards. And uh, I think, look, I think part of that too is uh, – uh, Sarkle helped those guys. They keep they keep helping the program till it's time to leave, and he'll help those guys. Yeah. I, I, there's some of that that plays into this as well. Um, so, and I think the worst thing you could do, honestly, as a prospect, this is just my or player in my opinion, is go all the way through spring practice and announce you're entering the portal four days before a spring game and don't take part. I'm not sure that's really the right uh, strategy for this if you're a player. Uh, so I expect the guys to play in the spring game that officially hit the portal. Uh, what about you, CJ? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for the most part, I believe most of these guys would like and prefer to stay at Texas. Of course, coming off of the college football playoff appearance, uh, you know that the long, the Texas one fund is going to take care of the guys on roster as well. That's, you know, the, the, the preferred choice. Of course, those conversations with the coaching staff and Steve Sarkeesian after when you kind of sit down and understand where you are in the pecking order might change where uh, your mindset is in terms of do you stick it out another year at Texas behind a couple guys or do you look for some grass that might be a little greener elsewhere. Regardless, sticking through the spring game allows you to take part in practice, stay, uh, stay a part of the weight room, and it also gives you that tape that you can take part of uh, and, and and kind of give out to guys uh, elsewhere if you are to enter the portal afterward. You know, you'll have three scrimmages under your belt. You'll be given a fair shot as a result of you being still bought into the program, uh, whereas, you know, you – if you, if you play your cards early, uh, Sarkeesian and the staff might be looking at the guy below you on the depth chart to get him some extra reps in front of a big crowd to see what he can do if you're already sitting there thinking you won't be a part of the program moving forward. So I'm with you, Jerry. I think after is when you'll start seeing a lot of these guys enter the portal, uh, at least announcing their intention. Hey, Rod, I want to ask you a little bit different question. Mm -hmm. um, and this is around the situation with Samaj A. Burrell because Jerry made him – referenced it you know you don't go in the portal right now unless you're kind of forced your hand is forced or you you make a big mistake mm -hmm. like Burrell did and is kind of on the way in there right um I want to ask you about that and then as it relates to that I'm sure you've been in a locker room where Steve Sarkeesian we're told had a a, a heavy conversation with mm -hmm. the team this week about you know taking care of your own business uh, and what happens when you don't, uh, whether that's uh, Samaj Burrell or Tavondre Sweat as yeah. a figure in that. You, you, I, I know for a fact you've been in locker rooms where a coach had to sit, stand up and say, hey, cut the crap. What, yeah. you know, where are you, you know, how do you, how is that received in the locker room? Are some guys like, like you were never that guy that I remember at least. I'm sure you had your mind. Hey, I didn't but get caught. <laughs> you may have been a knucklehead, but you were you were a, you were a different kind of knucklehead, man. That's what Akina would say. My point being, how is that? How does that conversation even occur? And how does it? How is it taken when somebody that they? I mean, look, Samaje was a well liked teammate. It wasn't yeah. like disliked on the team, and so they're seeing someone that they like and somebody that they revere, maybe a little bit, and Tavondre Sweat who's now had an issue as well as, as part of this, you know, give us a, a sense of a player's perspective of when you're sitting there and, and you're in the, you're in the uh, auditorium kind of like straight back, making sure you look straight forward. So the coach doesn't think you're a screw up. You know what I mean? What, what are your thoughts on that? I uh, know Mac had those, I mean, we had those instances where Mac had to address the team um, and come to us kind of on a man to man level and uh, Mac would always say, listen, man, my check is in your mouth. That's when Mac was really getting upset. When he started dropping, you know, those legs like that, like, hey, that's, you know, I, I need you guys to do your part, right? And that means uh, you have to be, uh, you, ha you have to 
have a conduct yourself in a certain way, even when you're necessarily not part of the team, but you need to conduct yourself because you are representing the University of Texas. Uh, so there were times where, I mean, you guys, some of those things were public when um, I played. I mean, even in 1999 before the bowl game, there were some guys who had some some issues and were suspended from the team. And I remember the turmoil there because that kind of came down at the last minute. And then I remember one of those moments where Mac brought everybody in and wanted to talk about hey, what's going on? I mean, where are my leaders at behind the scenes? You guys aren't regulating this? Because that's kind of how Mac was. Mac was like, hey, man, if you guys are regulating behind the scenes and nobody's getting in trouble and we're still able to win games and, you know, and the culture is translating constructively, hey, it's all good. Then Mac's a delegator and a CEO. But when somebody got caught doing something obviously bad and it was unbecoming of a, a, a player at the University of Texas or, you know, got caught with some very you know, discouraging, disappointing behavior, Mac had to step in. And so Mac wasn't necessarily, I think Sark is a lot hands on with the culture. He said that, right. Sark goes in there and observes it and tinkers with it. Seems to be every day. He's treating it like a living organism. Mac wanted the culture to kind of organically take root and then the players to really police it period. Sark wants the players to regulate it, but he's, He's pretty adamant and he's pretty, you know, detailed oriented about how he wants his coach to operate. Think about it. When that that Sark media media availability that happened, right? Uh, the last one, he came, he comes out and he addresses, I think, first the softball team and gives him a shout out. And then the first thing he says, unsolicited, he says, hey, man, I just want y'all to know that character is still more important than talent around here. And we got to get to the point where the, you know, the, the culture is is be, it meets the talent and last year we were at the point where the culture was beating our talent our code we had culture and it was a, a high priority for us and he came out of nowhere that was not a question that was him just kind of unsolicited that was on his heart right that was something that was heavy on his heart and i think it was because of that situation yes i think sark has been observing some things in the first 10 practices with this team and i'm not i'm not trying to be doom and gloom guy it's not at all i'm just trying to psychoanalyze sark I think he's observed some things through the first 10 practices. Think about it. Basically a brand new team. A lot of leadership gone. Way more new faces than we've ever had on the 40 acres for a spring. And Sark is probably observing some things and going, all right, guys, you listen, man. That's not exactly how we operate. And I would like for some of the leaders on this team to step up and regulate the culture with a little bit more detail and do it with a be committed to it a little bit more i think that's what he will say that's why that was on his heart i think he talked to the team about it like hey man i don't like i i don't necessarily love what i'm observing you guys are going to be a good team because we got the talent that's what you say we got the talent the culture now is the only thing that can really bring us down if our culture is not on point last year the culture was on point didn't quite have enough talent now he's saying we got the talent talent is not going to be an issue for us Culture may be an issue, behavior, patterns, habits. And that's why he came out. He started talking about character. He's talking about the culture. I think he was talking about that situation, but also combining that with some things that he's seen that he would like rectified before the end of spring. Just little tiny things on it, you know, with with his team and with the way they're operating and their methods and practice habits and all that kind of stuff. Because this is a brand new team for him. That's just my theory. I love it. I mean, look, that, that's firsthand knowledge because here, here's my perception. And I, Jerry, you and CJ can speak to this if you want to. The, the, the perception out there is, is that uh, he goes down there and lays the hammer, right? You know, yells and screams, gets mad, puffy, red face, then leaves the room. And everybody's all talking behind the scenes. That's not really how it works. I mean, he may go have some, some hard words, but the real work is after. Yep. Whether well or not they're listening, right? To, to Rod's part, it's what what he says is irrelevant. It's what they do that matters. Um, and so I, I feel that that's a good one. Uh, Jess Roberts, by the way, asked who was the player that was dismiss, dismissed from the team that we're talking about. Uh, North Crowley linebacker, a redshirt freshman, Samaj A. Burrell. Uh, he, they, I don't know that he was officially dismissed from the team. He was, uh, how did they put it? Uh, dismissed from the team. Or, no, he was removed from the team indefinitely. Yeah. And then they obviously that left some room in case he ever might come back. But then yesterday, Samaj uh, said goodbye. It, via it, it also allowed Samaj to say he was entering the portal instead of officially being kicked off publicly. But he was removed yeah. from the team. Yes. That matters. 
I was trying to be nice. Jerry, Jerry, nice. <laughs> Jerry said it a little cleaner. I'm hey, not Jerry, trying to be mean, but that's just what we reported. And we're yes, correct. that's player friendly, though. Jerry, that's player friendly. Hey, what's that, Rod? I said that's that's player friendly, though, because it's like being dishonorably discharged. Like nobody wants that. If I can have an honorable discharge, I'd rather that on my record. So when I go talk to other coaches and programs, hey, man, I decided to hit the portal. I wasn't dismissed from the team. I know it sounds crazy, but it actually does matter. That language matters. Fair enough. All right, uh, uh, Jerry, back to you here. This is from KD35. Uh, super chat. We appreciate it. Jerry, what's the latest with Texas and modern-day linebacker Nasir Wyatt? Seems that one Texas is, turn, is turning toward other targets now. Uh, heard – uh, Zion Williams locked in his OV with LSU, and it's before Texas. Nasir Wyatt, linebacker out of California, and then Zion Williams, a defensive lineman out of Lufkin. Yeah, I mean, uh, Elijah Barnes, who we had on um, on Texas football uh, to a Wednesday night, I think it was, um, he's a top target. Riley Pettijon, who will be in next weekend for the spring game, is a top target. Texas will continue to root Matai, uh, recruit Matai Tai. Tygo, the linebacker from San Clement, they committed to the USC. They won't, Texas won't give up on that guy. Uh, so I think those are kind of your guys. Jonathan Cunningham was on campus uh, yesterday. Uh, Texas is talking with him about a June official visit. I think they want to get his parent back for the spring game before that process uh, really happens, but it could happen before then. Uh, so Nasir White, the really good player off the edge at linebacker. I mean, really can run, can rush the passer. He's at modern day. I sent him a DM uh, when I saw that question, so we'll see if we get in, uh, if we get anything from him, but not anything I've heard as far as development of late. And there is a note I want to get out um, as well um, before I get to Zion Williams. Caleb Edwards, a quarterback out of El Dorado Hills in California, uh, Oak Ridge, uh, he's coming in June seventh through ninth, four-star defensive end from twenty twenty-five. Uh, Brandon Huffman of uh, 247 on the West Coast broke the news. I confirmed that news. Um, and Caleb Edwards then came back and double confirmed that news. Uh, but Caleb Edwards, 6'6", 225-pound, four-star tied in out of El Dorado Hills, California. Another so uh, another California kid is officially visiting June 7th through 9th. So that's four tied ends that have official visits uh, scheduled to Texas in June right now. On Zion Williams, yeah, I mean, Texas is always going to be the last visit. Texas has June 21st through 23rd. So it's done after that. It goes dead. So Texas had the last visit uh, uh, locked up, and that wasn't going to change. Uh, the LSU visit uh, in A&M and TCU, all, all four of those guys get official visits. Uh, TCU's May 3rd through 5th. The others will be in June. Um, so that's up to LSU and A&M to fight on those dates. I assume LSU will be the seventh through ninth. He should be there for the spring game uh, tomorrow, um, along with Brandon Brown, Texas commitment, who we've been talking about all week that he was going to, we'd reported on on texasfootball.com. He was going to schedule to be in Baton Rouge this weekend for the spring game. LSU's trying to get an official visit there. And then Cade Phillips, the safety out of high tower, assuming they can make it as scheduled to be at the uh, spring game as well. So three top targets for Texas, but on Zion Williams, Texas has had that last official visit date locked in for a while. Um, it would be interesting. I think it's a Texas-LSU battle. I think a and third, and I think TCU uh, uh, is in it due to family connections. Not that they don't have a chance, but I think Zion will play in the SEC. Hey, uh, before we go on to our next uh, – we've got some more questions here. I want to say uh, some, some uh, crazy news out of Brenham, Texas, just a few minutes ago. Apparently an 18-wheeler ran in. Uh, to the DPS office in Brenham on purpose because he was denied a commercial driver's license. Uh, it's not saying whether there are any fatalities, but uh, they are saying there are multiple serious injuries at this time. Uh, wow. That hit the wire about 13 minutes ago. Uh, so uh, sorry to hear about that. And wanted to say that to everybody. Uh, if you want to check in on anybody uh, in Brenham that you're worried about that works at the DPS uh, office there, uh, et cetera. All right. Uh, moving on, guys. Uh, we have some other questions here. Uh, we also have a plate, some places people are checking in from. Jerry, anybody anybody know where Dale, Texas is right now? I don't know that I've ever been to Dale, Texas. That beats me. I, I, saw, I saw somebody last name of Vogel checking in from San Diego, though. <laughs> yeah, mom's coming home. I've seen somebody's I've seen mom's somebody. checking in from San Diego. She's coming back to God's country. Hey, and you're you get leaving San Diego. I don't know about that one. I'd stay a little longer. <laughs> nice. Where is Dale, Texas? 
There, yeah. oh, there you go. Uh, Where is it at? Matt's got the map up for it. I can't, still can't see. Oh, interesting. Oh, it's not that far. Yeah, no, it's interesting. that's crazy. Rod, you should that. go do a live stream there. Yeah, yeah, you, really, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know there's a barbecue place there, by the way. Right, <laughs> right. You're dang right. The original right. Terry Platt, from, right? Dale, from Dale, Texas, we go to Zurich. <laughs> wow. Hey. I saw some, I saw what I think a Tetapare was in Mallorca. I mean, get out of here with that, man. <laughs> get out of here with that. If you say oh, you're playing with the doll too, really double get out of here. Uh, hey, Jerry, we, we got a, another recruiting question I think is good for us. Um, you mentioned that defensive lineman out of Georgia that was in town over the weekend. Some other guys are not over the weekend, but yesterday. Um, there's some other guys Texas is looking at. Where, what is Texas doing exactly in Georgia right now? We know they hired Kenny Baker, Georgia native, Tashard Choice, Georgia native, uh, experienced coaching in the state. What is Texas really trying to do right now in the state of Georgia? Uh, do they have a shot at these guys, or are they shots in the dark? Well, I mean, they got Josh Petty to campus, albeit with California the Power 7 on 17, four-star offensive tackle out of Roswell. Tough thing there is he has official visits already locked in in June, um, and, and they're all the dates that Texas would want to have him in. So we'll see if anything gets adjusted or if Texas gets him back with his parents. Um, look, Texas, they, they finished second on Daniel Calhoun last year. They're getting closer. They're inching closer. I do think the one thing to watch in the state of Georgia with Texas, not that the short choice doesn't do a really good job in the Atlanta area, but where Georgia is strong on an annual basis is defensive linemen. Mm -hmm. They run deep at defensive line in the Peach State, and that could be in the Atlanta metro area. That can be in South Georgia. I mean, Savannah's got two of the best in the country and number one ranked kid in the country right now in 25. Um, I think you're going to see Texas. I, I will not be surprised if Kenny Baker isn't seen a lot in Georgia evaluating defensive linemen in May. And that could be 25 kids. That could be some 26 kids. I think that's where you go, especially South Georgia. Georgia can't take them all. Nick's no longer at Bama. Clemson isn't what they were. They still recruited a high level. See if Florida figures their situation out. Florida State's on the come again, though, and it's a Kevin Wynn kid. They're the favorite, out of the kid we were talking about earlier out of Greene County. But I think you're going to see Texas attack defensive line more in Georgia and in Florida in the next few years. All right. Uh, good stuff there, Jerry. All right. Uh, we got another super chat uh, before we break for a quick commercial, and that is uh, Brandon Ralston, Jonte's world. It's about to be Derek Williams' world. Uh, DBU, DBU, the Raptor is said, coming. Uh, Rod, I know you love him, but I'm going to give CJ a chance to comment first. Hey, I love what I've been hearing about Derek Williams taking that step up and going into year two. His first spring practice, let's add that in there. Uh, Rod, you can talk about how important these spring practices are for young defensive backs who are still, you know, and uh, Derek Williams might be the exception here, but getting up to speed with uh, diagnosing routes, concepts, uh, and where the ball is going from the quarterback. Right now, Derek Williams, uh, again, he's probably your best cover safety on the roster at the moment. And, you know, it, it's fun looking at, uh, you know, the talent right now in that what will be sophomore class next year, Jonte Cook on the offensive side of the ball, Derek Williams right now. I mean, these are guys that are going at it. You can add Jelani McDonald to that group as well. A lot going on. And, hey, Rod, I, I wanted to touch on what we talked about a little bit yesterday too, getting that swag back in that group of defensive backs. You can look at uh, Derek Williams right now is a guy who's certainly going to be uh, bringing the juice there. Of course, the addition of Andrew Makuba as well. That DB group, very exciting, making some big plays and certainly starting to get back to the roots of what we saw several years ago uh, with Texas, you know, kind of having that swagger in the back, that uh, the, the secondary there and kind of returning close step-by-step step to DBU. It's not there yet. You got to go see them make the plays. But Derek Williams is certainly going to start spearheading that return to what we saw, you know, years ago when Texas was at its peak back there. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, coverage specialist, number one. That's what you get with Derek Williams. The guy can cover, uh, as CJ said. I mean, he's your best coverage safety as a freshman last year. I think the one thing I would like to see him work on, and I'm sure he's already working on, the coaches are working on him with him too, is his ability to diagnose – 
the run play and and hit the correct angles to the football, running the alley, as they would say, from that that deep safety position or that too high shell position. Um, if he can do that, he started doing it a lot better later on in the season. But if he can do that, become that alley cat uh, that, you know, I talk about the safety position, be a guy that can diagnose where the ball is going to pop and predict where the ball is going to pop based on, and this is why your, your, your football IQ has got to be really high. you got to know what other guys' jobs are, what their responsibilities are in the run game, and then you can actually predict where the ball is going to pop, where it's most likely to pop, depending on you know what guys' responsibilities. Or is, that, is that their position to spill it, or are they supposed to keep contained, force it inside? You learn that, and it helps you diagnose the angle to the football. And Jalen Catalan was great at it. Can't, couldn't stay healthy. Um, as the alley cap, but he was fantastic being able to come downhill and be able to meet the ball carrier and be the force run defender, even from the safety position. So I think that's what I want to see him work on. He's got the speed for that, no doubt. He don't have to really work on coverage. The guy can cover. I mean, like I said, that's a natural skill. Most guys, they do that naturally, and he's a natural coverage specialist. Yeah, and it certainly helped going up against those two first round picks that we, you know, hope to hear on uh, April 25th of Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell. Now seeing that speed and explosivity remain a little bit right now, this Texas group, it's it's going to help in the long run w- without a doubt. Hey, Rod, I, would- I know you got to tell people about Autograph in, in a second, uh, one of our big sponsors. But when we come back, Bobby, I want us, I want Rod to hit on something we talked about this morning on Coffee and Football, how better edge pass rush, better safety plays, more speed at safety can help Texas play more aggressive at corner and why mm-hmm. that can help the defense next year. Sounds good. Rod, right, you got autograph, buddy. All right, let's tell you about autograph, folks. All right, we're all pumped, of course, for the game in Arbor coming up. Uh, would you like a chance to win $4 tickets to the big house this fall against Michigan in honor of our four national championships Looking to get five in 2025, uh, looking to get five up there in 2024. But these tickets are retailing for six hundred plus dollars. So if you're looking to get some of these tickets uh, at a great bargain basement price, listen up. Our partner Autograph is dropping a pair of tickets on April 18th at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time in their app. All you need to do is download the app and refer one friend successfully. That's all you got to do from Wednesday uh, of April 3rd, but now up until April 18th. April 18th is your deadline at 11 a.m. You have until then to refer one friend successfully after downloading the app, and then you will be eligible for this prize. For those that are new, Autograph is where real Longhorn fans get unreal rewards by bringing fan content and communities into one place. Autograph is the first app that recognizes and rewards fans, turning their passion into access and experiences. Co-founded by the GOAT, Tom Brady, on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans. Scan to download the free Autograph app in the Apple App Store and use the referral code on Texas. That's the referral code on Texas. Join us and see where your fandom takes you, hopefully, to Ann Arbor this fall with $4 tickets from our friends at the Autograph app. So thank you very much for their support. Hey, Rod, take that question from Jerry about uh, the additional edge pressure, uh, more more speed potentially at safety, uh, and what that and how that Im- impacts the corners uh, it at, for Texas and whether or not they can play more aggressively this year. Yeah, um, I think they definitely will play more aggressively. There's no doubt about that. They started doing it um, at the tail end of last season, right, the last three games. So they want to play more bump and run coverage on the boundary and the field side. So I think they will. Um, And that's a great question about the edge pressure. You know, when you have uh, and you got better coverage safeties as well. So I just wonder now with those one on one matchups that you're going to have on the outside when you want to play man to man coverage, you you can almost kind of force the quarterback into where you want him in the pocket. Uh, Because, you know, last year you were almost forcing him out of the pocket because the pressure was coming from the interior. And the quarterbacks would either have to roll or find a way, like Michael Penix, right, to avoid the pressure and then find a way to keep your eyes downfield. But that's a great place for the pressures, that interior pressure. Texas pressure coming from the edges, I think it's going to force the quarterback up into the pocket a lot of the times. And he could collapse it and he decide to abandon the pocket. That's great altogether. But I think it'll force the quarterbacks up into the pocket. Um, And I think if you're looking at, the types of throws they're going to have to make. I mean, the toughest throws uh, are you going to be outside those numbers there for those cornerbacks. So you talk about essentially making quarterbacks 
have to make the toughest types of throws through the smallest windows. If you're playing more man coverage, bump and run man coverage, you can shrink those passing windows. And if you're coming, the pressure's coming from the edges, I think the belief is that with the quarterback stepping up, all right, that they'll have to make the throws on the outsides of the numbers. You should, you should have inside leverage, taking away the inside cuts with the safeties being able to have sticky coverage inside on your tight ends and your running backs and your safety valves. So theoretically, the only throws the quarterback should be able to make with regularity that are give him open field and open space to throw to will be outside the numbers between the sideline and the numbers. And that's a really tough throw for most quarterbacks to make unless you got a golden arm. So that to me, that would be the belief is that, all right, we can play heavy inside leverage, which I think they got to do if they're playing man coverage. I got safeties that can cover and we can take away the inside of the field. And you did that last year when you played more man coverage against Tech and against Oklahoma State in the Big 12 title game. And you did it against Washington, too. The problem was you gave up the vertical routes. Right? They were giving up the, that, that space that I talk about. In and they were sliding field. protection, too, right, Rod? That's the yeah. key with the edge pressure. It takes yeah. away the ability to slide protection, does it not? Yeah, because you're going to have it coming from both both sides. So, yeah, you slide to one side or another, it doesn't do any good. Now, remember, Mike, they did that against with Michael Penix, and Michael Penix was able to do his yeah. own little sh- slide and Har- Harlem shuffle his way out of danger when a guy like Ethan Burke is going to light him up. So, I mean, like I said, I, I think we saw some of it last year where they took away the easy completions, the inside cuts with the bump and run press man coverage. Problem was the space that I talk about that you open up, that's vertically down the sidelines between the numbers and the sideline. Okay. You can give that up. And how much did they give that up against Oklahoma State and against Washington? That's where you're vulnerable if you're taking away the easy completions. Got to safeguard yourself against that. Now, if you got an Earl Thomas back there, all right, a guy that got range as a free safety, as that single high safety, then you can really play loose and be really hard inside leverage and almost play a little bit of, you know, kind of man under technique really taking away everything and undercutting everything because you know at the last possible uh point of you know at the last possible point of execution when the quarterback's trying to connect with the receiver you know your your safety gonna be there to make it a tough an even tougher throw now maybe Derek Williams could be that guy but I think you want Derek Williams in coverage so who who's gonna be your middle field safety also is gonna play a big role in you know that that method if you're gonna play more press man coverage all right here's here's the question that's a follow-up then to that who is it he only for only 93. Will Makuba, Andrew Makuba, be a better addition than Jalen Catalan? Uh, definitely more Whoa. of a cover guy. In coverage, no question. No question about it. But not, but not the guy that's gonna light you up like Catalan would. But no, but see, I almost say Catalan like he didn't he wasn't healthy enough. So, like, I he didn't impact Texas making a college football playoff or not last year. And I think. If he's healthy, he'll win the player of the year in that conference at UNLV. I think the guy's a hellacious instinctive football player. But he wasn't a factor in Texas making a no. college football playoff last year. He wasn't healthy. Jerry, so, he played 140 snaps. Edition. What'd you he, say? He, only, he played 140 snaps last year for Texas. It's almost completely forgettable that he was on the field because in the role that we saw him in, you know, it just it, there wasn't the impact that you expected with the name coming in and also with the rotations and the way that Texas plays their secondary. You didn't see him as 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 often back there. Of course, the injuries are very unfortunate, and that's certainly what kept him out. Uh, from, from really reaching the ceiling of what I think a lot of Texas fans expected him to be while on campus here. But you go back and you look at what Andrew Makuba did a year ago. This guy doesn't come off the field. He played 620 snaps a year ago in 10 games. Yeah. So if you talk about impact and the way that you'll see an imprint from Makuba versus Catalan, you'll certainly see Makuba around the football making more plays because I think that is one of the best abilities, obviously, is availability. Makuba mm-hmm. provides that more so than what we yeah. saw at least mm-hmm with Catalan a year ago. Also, the two are a little bit different. Uh, Catalan, certainly that guy that you'll expect screaming down the hill. Um, you know, Rod, you call him the alley cat. Uh, Makuba, yeah. a guy that a little bit more rangy, uh, about 186, 190 pounds right now. He's not going to be the guy that blows someone's head off, but he will stick on the field and be more, uh, I guess, of an impact player for the Longhorns as a result of that. I want to mention this guy, too, because it's uh, worth mentioning, and that's uh, Jelani McDonald. Yeah. Uh, Texas coaches have – Mentioned him recently. A couple of players have mentioned him recently as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, light bulb comes on for him at safety. 
scary. That could be, that could be a big plus. Uh, for I, he, he's he's gonna he's gonna be he's gonna kind of be the guy that has to deal on saying, "I look good. He looks good. Do you feel good about what you're doing? If you feel good, you're gonna play good." <laughs> That's Johnny McDonald because he looks great when he, he walks out on the field. Now, how do you feel? about your assignments if you feel good about that you're gonna play good i have no doubt about that like that <laughs> hell yeah nice Jerry. Nice Jerry Jerry doing his best Deion like hey that's money right Deion. there i didn't have that on my bingo card for today <laughs> uh, daniel sheehan uh jerry or cj cj where do you think caleb chester the corner out of fort bend falls on texas's board either one of you guys want to take that yeah, I think he's behind some other guys. Obviously, Dorian Brew uh, and Aiden Anding, who now is June 21st through 23rd set up. Caleb Chester scheduled to be in town uh, this weekend, actually. I think he double confirmed that with me during maybe before the show. Uh, but uh, um, he's scheduled to be in town uh, tomorrow to watch Texas uh, scrimmage. Um, and he'll be back for June 7th through 9th official visit. And we'll see th where things uh, kind of line up. Right now, I think obviously Dorian Brew, uh, later June official visit expected, probably 14th through 16th, but it hasn't been released yet. And then Aiden Anning on the 21st through 23rd. So I think those are some names to look out. Cortland Guillory, more of a boundary corner, I think, is it more of a safety long term. He's mm -hmm. scheduled to be in June 7th through 9th as well. And I'll just go ahead and finish up the DB talk. I mean, Kate Phillips is in June 21st through 23rd. Uh, I think one of the best safety prospects in the country. Uh, Texas, I thought, did well with Jonah Williams last week. Um, we'll see if that official visit gets set up. I suspect he'll officially visit Texas, uh, Jonah Williams from Ball. That's kind of your top DBs right now. Good stuff there, Jerry. All right, uh, you're listening to the Friday Afternoon Live Stream. I'm Bobby Burton, Rod Babers alongside with C.J. Vogel and Jerry Hamilton. We're taking your, uh, your uh, questions this afternoon, a little bit of a roundtable for ontexasfootball.com. I want to remind you guys that we now have premium content available at uh, on Texas football. We're asking you to become an OG, become an OTF OG for just $39.95 a year. Uh, that's $20 off the regular price, which is $59.95. Or you can do a monthly subscription for $5.95. That's where you'll get premium subscription and content uh, like none other. On TexasFootball.com is the URL, OTF OG. Uh, we appreciate you guys and everything. Uh, looks like Jay Witt uh, has started to, uh, you know, he's had these issues with the hamstring rod, CJ and Jerry. Um, he posted that he ran a 4-4-2 at his own kind of pro day uh, type situation. Uh, so that's pretty good for him. Uh, we're happy that he was a actually able to finally compete, CJ. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, it's great. If that's the time for Jordan Whittington that's being passed on the scouts, now you start giving yourself a chance to end up in the NFL draft. Of course, uh, not being able to participate in any of the postseason, um, you know, draft activities has really hurt Jordan Whittington. He was kind of one of those fringe guys that you'd expect to see maybe in the sixth or seventh to the undrafted range. I think 4-4-2, especially after giving himself uh, the fifth most bench reps, you know, at the combine, it gives yourself an opportunity. And I think every piece of, uh, you know, advice or, uh, you know, suggestions that, that folks are looking for in terms of Jordan Winnington are going to point him in the direction of being a, a guy that you want on your football team. That's kind of what you expect when you talk to guys that play with Jordan Winnington, uh, you know, kind of recruited him, coached him, whatever it is. Great football player, great player. Now that you're starting to get these measurables that line up with the athlete that he was coming out of high school, now you start getting an idea uh, of what might be his path to the NFL, especially in the draft, which still might look like a long shot. 4-4-2 is a great start there. Hey, hey Bobby, you got to get bring up the super chat. Uh, you know I am. Me yes. and Rod, this, they're calling you. Rod, I set you funny. up this morning. I apologize. Uh, what I do? Rod, heard you looking for smoke is <laughs> in NCAA football. <laughs> we, we, we said hey, Rod, people were talking dude, trash with you this morning. Rod, hey. people want a live stream playing you. Apparently, I'll say this. I'll say this. Back in the day, I used to be pretty damn good. Now I haven't played it forever, but I will accept the challenge. I will go. Who, who am I playing? First of all, who am I playing CJ? Nobody claims he was the number one ranked guy from 05 to 08, and the whole thing. Oh, in that case, he's going he's gonna, probably going to whip me pretty damn good. I think but, that's when he was a, I think yeah. he goes, he's Casey on our chats in the morning. No, no, I will, no I'll play because I, uh, I, listen, I used to get on the game all the time. Now I just don't have a lot of time to do it, but I, I am open. I'm down. I do, can I, I got to get some practice rounds in though. So 
I gotta find me a gaming system. I might have to hook up with CJ and get a gaming system. <laughs> Here's another one of my takeaways. We gotta get a picture of your picture on Instagram of you in the game. You oh, were man. in the game and get that frame for the back wall back there. <laughs> You mean that uh, Rob was an OG? He was in the game. You mean that pixelated uh, yes. monster that I look like with those heavy shoulder pads? I'll sit next to you guys again, but uh, trust me, that ain't, that ain't nothing to brag about being being looking that old in the video game. But I actually own I own the game. I just, I don't know what I think it's on. Man, I'm pretty sure it's on the PlayStation or Xbox. But I do own the game though that I'm on. I do own all the games that I'm on. It's only like three or four of them. So, well, I got to say this, uh, Rod, uh, you. Uh, you you told me one time that you ran the option a lot uh, in that game, so we'll we'll yeah, see. Hey. we'll see what you can do. Back in our day, you people still running the option back in in the Big Twelve when I got to the Big Twelve. I mean, Nebraska was dominating the Big Twelve, running the option. Whether you have, that's how old I am. <laughs> uh, I, I, I you know I want to change change subject a little bit here, talk about something a little bit uh, more serious, but also just great to see a lot of Texas football players out doing a lot of Texas one fun events yep. this week uh of course we always try to support texas one fund and uh, give them publicity whenever we can this is terrence brooks uh on his twitter uh and something he posted earlier today matt our producer is going to put it up uh good stuff here uh, uh terrence brooks and a couple other longhorns uh, at a pop-up birthday party uh for folks uh oh, wow. that are in foster care hmm. so they, look the thing about Texas One Fund, it's a 5013C, and that means that it's all it's it's benefiting other nonprofits around the state of Texas. Uh being and, and going out there and showing up for kids' birthday parties that are in uh foster care. Uh love to see it. Uh love to see that stuff. Thanks, Mac, for uh Matt, uh, our producer, uh, for bringing that up for us. Um, hey, look, uh, let's go to this next question. I'll take it uh here. Uh, try to at least uh, from uh, Ryan Nelson. If it gets up there, uh, Banks Neto Majors DJ Cam Williams. Isn't this what you've been waiting for for over twenty years? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So first of all, I don't know that Nato's definitely in instead of Aiden Connor, okay, or even Cole Hudson. But I will say this: Yes, it's what I've been waiting for for twenty years. I mean, I've wanted five guys that are NFL caliber players on the offensive line at the same time. When's the last time we saw that? 05, 06? Yeah. I mean, it was I mean, 05. Chris Paul didn't play in the NFL, even though good player. And Will um, Allen Will Allen didn't even have interest Will in Allen. doing the camp, right? But here's yeah. what I've been waiting on for 20 years. Five guys that caliber. Cole Hudson had started 13 games as true freshman year. Could very well have a career in football if he stays healthy, right? Uh, Hayden Connor, the, the depth. The depth. I mean, Trevor Goosby redshirted last year, young offensive tackle. Texas has – I've been waiting on the depth because – let's think about this for a second, guys. And I'm not – if anything happens, I didn't jinx anything. I don't believe in that. I'm not Dan Hurley wearing the same pair of underwear every NCAA tournament game for two <laughs> years in a row, okay? But, uh, look, Texas couldn't withstand an injury or two now. Two years ago, the 8-5 and five season, they were healthy all the way through. All five of the same starters for 13 games, that very rarely happens in college football. Last year, you had a little bit of injury, right? But this is the first year that I look to, guys, where it's serious depth. Meaning, and I say serious depth, if you had a couple of rough luck injuries that knocked guys out for three or four games, you'd be all right. I think that's the biggest compliment you can almost give the Texas staff right now, you can withstand injury and still move the football and still operate your offense. That's a good point. I, look, I just, it's beyond depth for me. It's actually top end talent too, Jerry. Yeah. I mean, it's both. I mean, look, Sam Cosby, good player in the NFL, Connor Williams, multi-year starter. Texas has had a few guys here and there, but other than Cosby, you know, have they had a guy? Right. And they have it. And Kelvin Banks is the dude. Right. Cam Williams looks like he could be. Then you've got DJ Campbell. You've got J I mean, you've got not just OK players, but you got you may have multiple guys that are multiple year NFL. Oh, no. that, that's the so it's not just my point is it's not just overall depth, which you're definitely right about. Right. It's also high end depth. Yeah. yeah. 
which is, is kind of look. I think somebody may not start a game at Texas and be an NFL player one day. I think that's the type of depth Ooh. Texas has. Well, I mean, look at this. If you think about it, I mean, it's like when Texas had not. They didn't just have Justin Blaylock. They also had Jonathan Scott. Yeah. Right. And so it wasn't just one guy that was high level. It was multiple guys right. that were high level on those offensive lines that were so and, good. And Tony okay. was a backup on that team for depth. I mean, they had they had it at that time. Yeah. Hey, this is a one for – I'm going to let you take this, Rod, CJ, whoever wants to. How fast is Amari Nye Black versus JT Sanders? Uh, CJ, I know you talked to Gunnar Helm yesterday. You may have a little bit more on that. Yeah, that was the first way that he described Amari Nye Black and his addition to the tight end room since joining the Longhorns is that speed is very noticeable. You know, he kind of gallops like a gazelle out there. And the way that he changes direction is something that I think this tight end room uh, – is certainly welcoming. You know, you look at a Juan Davis, you look at what JT Sanders did a year ago, you know, they're athletic tight ends. They can go make plays down the field. I don't think either of them possess kind of that four or five, very low four, six speed that we saw or expect to see with a, in Amari Nye Black. Uh, of course, JT Sanders, uh, pro day wasn't great, but he did put up some solid times in the 40 yard dash for a tight end. Uh, it's going to be different with Amari Nye Black. And that's whoever you talk to, especially with this Texas group who've mentioned him in uh, player availability so far this spring. That's the first thing they say is, yeah, that kid's got some wheels on him. And I think Sarkeesian uh, is certainly going to find ways to use him in those deep crossing routes to stretch the field vertically. Of course, you have the speed on the outside. What's going to open up? the middle of the field there. And he's going to be a guy that certainly benefits as a result, but the speed right now certainly points in favor of Amari Nye black versus what we saw a year ago with JT Sanders, who made a lot of his hay uh, with contested catches and guys kind of draped on his back. That'll be a little bit different than what we saw uh, a year ago. Hey, yeah. I got a little breaking news here before C Rod hits this. Uh -oh. uh, Nasir Wyatt just hit me back, said he's coming in for the spring game next weekend. So, Nasir Wyatt, four-star linebacker, modern day, says he's coming into Austin for the spring game next week. Go ahead, Rob, because I'm, I want to hear your answer, and I want to lead you into this one. JT uh, Sanders was your guy that unlocked the offense last year. Right? I think so. yeah. What happens if it's a different player, but Nye Black is – the best compliment I can give Nye Black, seeing him in person, he moves like a wide receiver at 6'3", 230. Mm -hmm. So a 4'5 guy at tight end, even though they're different players, what does that do for the Texas offensive start? Uh, yeah, it's just going to look a lot different, right? Because he did. I mean, he he had JT Sanders on the move, motioning, shifting more than any other player on that offense and probably at a top 10 rate of any player in, in, in the power five. He was constantly on the move, hunting matchups because he was such a matchup nightmare, probably the biggest matchup nightmare on that offense last season. But it wasn't with speed, as CJ mentioned. I mean, I think he ended up getting like 53% like of his contested catches, hauled those in. And a bunch of those were explosive plays, right? 15 plus yard plays downfield. So his skill set was uh, he had more power um, and more physicality in his skill set than Night Black does. But Night Black definitely has the speed advantage. So I think Sarks could just dial it up a, a little bit differently. I think he'll, um, you know, more of those tight end screens, which was one of the most effective plays for Texas last year. If you're looking at yards per play, tight end screens. Remember those those Y leaks play, passes where the H would leak out or the Y would leak out after uh, you know a play action pass and you see Gunnar Heron running wide open down the sideline. I can see you know some of those for for Night Black too. The problem is, you know, Texas runs a lot of split, <clears throat> excuse me, run a lot of split inside zone or split flow, which is where you would see JT Sanders come back across the formation yeah. with that back, uh, he would come to, uh, blocking that backside and sealing off that backside. That's important in Sark's office because they run a ton of split wide zone and a ton of split inside zone. And I think Gunnar Helm can be that guy, but when they go 12 personnel, it, it's really predictable, right? If it's the same guy every time, it's like, oh, well, it's going to be Gunnar Helm coming with that split block, uh, that cross block, and you know Amari Nyback's going to be going downfield. So I wonder how he's going to handle that because I think when you had Helm and you had JT Sanders, you were confident in both of those guys making those types of blocks in the run game. And I'm not saying that both of those guys are elite run blockers by any stretch, but definitely more than willing and capable. And I wonder if you're going to be able to replicate that with Amari Nyback. We know he can get open downfield and create separation, but – you know, the, the subtle nuances of the tight end position. The reason Sark says it's the second most important position behind quarterback is because of the run blocking element added to it. All right. Hey, Jerry, I want to make sure I got, got that that uh, breaking news. Nasir White, that's the linebacker out of modern day, right? Yep. 
Okay, he's coming in for the spring game. So we'll add him uh, to that spring game invitee slash uh, coming in list that we have on Texas football, Jerry and CJ uh, managing that for us and putting that together. And, so and, and look, another modern day kid, Southern California kid, ranked top 100 in the country. Really good pass rusher from the linebacker position. But again, adding Johnny Nansen to Sark, uh, Chris Jackson, Jeff Banks even recruited out there some, but really in Arizona. Texas is a stronger recruiting footprint in California than in the history of the program, even though Steve Bernstein did great work in California. Ricky Williams, Will Goodlow, all those guys. This is a mutt, the strongest recruiting footprint Texas has had in California in my years doing this, Bobby. Bryant Westbrook out yeah, there as well. Ocean side. Yeah, don't don't forget about those. Hey, I, I, I want to say this. Uh, thank you all for joining us. If we did not get to your question today, uh, it's my apologies. We've got to get going here. we got a bunch of different stuff. Uh, glad that Jerry was able to uh, uh, get that answer for Kurt KD35, I am the beast, uh, on Nasir Wyatt. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, that's going to do it uh, for this afternoon's roundtable. Thank you all for joining us, whether you watched us uh, on uh, on uh, YouTube, listened to us on Twitter, or going to uh, download us on Apple or Spotify. Please just uh, visit us wherever you want to. Also, come visit us at uh on texasfootball.com. Remember, you can get uh, $20 off an annual subscription. Uh, just become an OG. OTFOG is the special coupon code uh, for $20 off your annual subscription at On Texas Football. Thank you, too, for Flat Creek Estate Winery and what they do as well as autograph. For Jerry, Rod, CJ, as well as our producer, Matt Hutchison. Guys, y'all have a good weekend. Hook them. Rod and uh, Coach okay. Shipley will have a little football theory later this afternoon into the evening. Y'all take care, guys. Have a good weekend.